topics that you can predict, right? But you're not sort of forced doing a bunch of research on a bunch of random stuff, and then you've always got something to say on the negative team, right? Top cap allows you to limit the scope of the topic to make sure that affirmatives are germane or relevant to what everybody assumes we're debating about, in this case, economic engagement with Cuba, Mexico, or Venezuela, rather than letting them sort of do their own thing, to withdraw troops in South Korea, or to put, you know, you know, the space station back up, or whatever craziness, you know, they kind of want to talk about, right? You're prepared to debate economic engagement with Latin America this year. You're not prepared to debate the space topic, right? You're not prepared to debate the social services topic. You're not prepared to debate US, USFE should substantially change its foreign policy towards Russia, which is a high school topic that I debated on way, 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 way back in the day. Right, so as you can see, I sort of have this graph. It's a sort of visual representation of how topicality allows us to view ground, or who gets what arguments, okay? The big circle, the brown circle, represents, right, the ground delineated by the resolution, right? So in this case, USFG should increase its economic engagement with Cuba, Mexico, in Venezuela, all of the potential examples of that are in the brown circle. Okay? Right? The Cuba app that we've written for you guys is the red dot. Right? It fits within that brown circle. Right? But there are other parts of the brown circle that are also potential affirmatives, right? Give economic assistance to Venezuela, maybe give technical assistance to Mexico um, with regard to their telecom industry, maybe other, like lift the embargo with Cuba, right? That would, those would be other red dots within that round circle, okay? Right, and as we talked about a little bit ago, right, a while ago, everything that's considered gray or charcoal, I guess, would be considered negative or not. Everything outside of the round circle would be the negatives, and everything within the brown circle would be the affirmatives. Okay? Seems pretty simple, right? Well. About 20 years ago, things started to change a little bit, right? And instead of everything on the outside of the brown circle representing negative ground, everything outside of the red dot was considered negative ground, right? So not only do you get to say stuff that's outside of the resolution, i.e. things that aren't economic engagement with Venezuela, Cuba, and Mexico, you can also make arguments that are outside of our affirmative, in this case, energy cooperation with Cuba. So the affirmative stands up and is like, hey, we should remove restrictions on energy cooperation with Cuba, right? Modern day right debate, right? Topicality says everything that's outside of the affirmative plan is negative for now. So the negative team can stand up and say, you know what, we should end the embargo, right? Well, is that an example of the USFG increasing the economic engagement with Cuba? Yeah. It is, right? And so, there's this weird thing that emerged that negative ground sort of became conceptualized in a different way. And topicality not only delineated what was fair ground for the affirmative and the negative, but it also helped delineate what actual negative ground was. That once the affirmative staked its claim as a topical plan, everything outside of the specific affirmative became negative ground, right? So as opposed to 1982, right, when everything out in the charcoal was negative ground, in, in 2013, most people consider everything outside of the red dot negative ground. Now, there's a debate to be had. There's some theory arguments about like whether negative teams get to advocate top collection and stuff like that. And we're going to talk about that more when we talk about counter plans. But in general, they all point to the importance of topicality in dividing ground between the affirmative and the negative. Right? That's a primary function of topicality, and it's something you've got to keep in mind. Well, why is topicality important? We've already talked about a little bit of these, but I want to go over them again. First is that it limits the scope of the topic. Right? It forces discussion over an agreed upon subject. In this case, US economic engagement with Cuba, Mexico, and Venezuela. Right? And why is that important? Well, it's important because it limits the scope of discussions to ensure clash. Right? When we're all prepared to debate the same topic, do you think that we're going to have a more fruitful discussion of that topic? Obviously, right? right? Deontay, if you come in and you're prepared to talk about US engagement with Mexico, and then your opponents stand up and they're like, hey, we should go to space. Are you prepared to have that discussion? No. Not really, right? And so is that discussion going to be really educational or fruitful at all? No, it's going to be two ships passing in the night. And that's not what we want in debate, right? We want debate to be an exchange of ideas, presumably about a common topic, so we can get really in-depth and have a clash of those ideas. And topicality allows us to do that by limiting the scope of the discussions, right? It ensures that both sides prepare to debate U.S. economic engagement with the topic countries that are out there. Right? It also helps reduce research burdens. Right? How many things could you possibly research? A lot. Potentially infinite, right? 
If you just were like going to Google and you type in the word topic, right? How many hits are you going to get? A bazillion, right? A ton, right? And that shows you how many potential topics we could possibly debate, right? Are you prepared to research two billion topics? Believe it or not, you're not. Okay, and neither am I. Okay, but instead, are you prepared, or presumably, could you be prepared to research U.S. economic engagement with Cuba, Mexico, and Venezuela? Yeah, because it's a lot more manageable. It's one topic out of potentially two billion, right? And topicality allows us to focus on that singular topic, so that instead of researching two billion things, which we possibly can't do, right, we can instead research one thing, right? It's easier to research one topic well than it is a thousand, right? It's why in high school you don't have 500 classes to choose from. You have like, yeah, right? Presumably because you get better and you can research more and become an expert in those single areas, right? And lastly, it ensures in-depth discussions over the specifics of the topic. Remember, we learn a lot more because we have in-depth debates about one topic over the course of the year rather than a bunch of different topics. Now, Public Forum and LD, right, they do topic changes, right? Every couple of months they have a different topic, right? But they don't have a different topic every weekend, do they? No, that'd be too hard to do. Right? You got school to do on the weekends. You got a family. Maybe you play baseball. Maybe you dance. Maybe you are an archer. Who knows? Right? You've got other stuff to do, right? And even having a different topic every weekend would be asking too much for you to keep up with from a research standpoint and a debate standpoint and just a general knowledge standpoint. And policy debate, right, has sort of adopted the uh, I guess the idea that one topic per year is a good idea. And topicality ensures that we stick with that one topic per year. Because it ensures that we have clash. It ensures we can have manageable research, and it ensures that we have in-depth debates, which most people consider an important step in learning about these topics and broadening your education. The second thing that we've already talked about is it helps to divide ground between the affirmative and the negative. Right? Ground in this case meaning the types of argument each side can use within debates. Right? Affirmative ground usually means right, that ground or that literature that argues in favor of economic engagement with topic content i.e. anything that involves USFG increasing economic engagement with Cuba, Mexico, or Venezuela, you can kind of you can consider affirmative ground. Right? And negative ground involves everything else. Sort of go back to the sort of diagram that we had. Round circle equals that ground, charcoal outside of it equals that ground. It's a way to divide ground. We've already talked about how that division of ground has sort of changed in modern day debate, but in general, top county serves the same function. It sort of makes a line, right? The goal line in football represents what? The goal line. All right, well, or a touchdown, right? So if you're like on the two yard line, have you scored yet? No. No, you have to do what in order to score? We score. Did not even want. Right, to get more points, right? And likewise, right, there's a line that Top County demarcates in debates, right? On one side is ground, or you're on the three yard line, you haven't scored any points. On the other side of the line is a touchdown, or in this case, you are a top goal affirmative, and we can then proceed to evaluate other aspects of what you're arguing. Right? So top county again serves to divide ground between the affirmative and the negative. Other key issues as it relates to top county. One is definitions. Right? We've already had this discussion in our lab yesterday, and you might have had this discussion in the other lab as well, but how do we know what these terms mean? How do we know what economic engagement means? Well, presumably we don't know ourselves. We might have had some ideas, but we aren't experts, right? We aren't economists, we aren't with maths, we aren't trade negotiators. Right? Instead, how do we know what these terms mean? Well, we do research, and we try to find definitions of those terms that have a clear idea of what they mean. So that we have an even better idea of what that means for the topic, how it shapes its meaning, how it divides ground, etc. Right? And so terms in the resolution, like economic engagement, increase, and substantially, and even Cuba, right, are defined in order to identify their meanings. Right? We define Cuba so that we can determine whether or not Guantanamo is actually a part of Cuba or not, right? We define Mexico so that we can determine whether or not the Baja Peninsula is a part of Mexico or not, right? Or we define substantially to determine whether or not it means quantitative things like a percentage or a monetary amount, or whether it means qualitative things like fuzzy stuff, like, oh, it's just better, trust us, right? And these definitions typically come from dictionaries and contextual sources, right? So Webster's, check, right? It's probably got definitions of things like substantially and should and increase. Right? And then contextual sources, like those that are in your evidence packet, right, help us define terms like economic engagement. Right? 
So there's this guy named Silk, C-E-L-I-K, who's like a master student in Turkey. And for whatever reason, he likes to write about economic engagement. And so if you read through the file, you'll see multiple pieces of evidence from the Selleck guy who tries to define the term economic engagement. Right? And there are other things like Haas and Sullivan that uh, Michaela mentioned yesterday, and other pieces of evidence, contextual evidence, that try to help us determine what that key term means in the resolution. Right? And we attempt to define those terms so that we have an idea of what the topic means, because that's an important step to determining how it defines what the affirmative gets to say, and then what it, how it defines what the negative gets to say. Second is interpretations, right? The affirmative and negative often argue over how the resolution should be understood, how it should be interpreted, right? How we should interpret the meaning of the resolution. And most topicality debates, right, revolve around competing interpretations, i.e., whose interpretation is better for debate, right? Whose interpretation creates better ground for the affirmative and the negative. Whose interpretation maybe creates a more educationally, no, educationally result from the topic, right? What does the resolution mean and what should it mean, right? And there's no shit with competing interpretations we're going to talk about in a second. But when the affirmative and negative are arguing about topicality, they often argue whose interpretation of the resolution matters more, right? And you come up with the reasons why your interpretation is better than theirs. Competing interpretations. Right. This is the popular view of debating and evaluating debates over topicality. Right? In 1964, there's this thing called jurisdiction. And basically, judges who would sit in the back of the room would make their own determinations about whether or not a, a case fell within their jurisdiction. So, the, I don't know, if I'm going to guess nobody's parents are judges. Right? I was going to judge. Uh -huh. right. Maybe they are. Right? But judges in general, right, they rule on cases. Right? Well, they don't rule on every case. So like if I'm like a family judge and someone comes into court and is like, hey, this guy stole my dog, is that a family issue? Yeah. For some people, but in general, in the eyes of the law, it's not. Right? It's like a property issue. Right? And so that judge would be like, it's not within my jurisdiction to rule on this case. This is a property case, not a family case. And so they would dismiss that. And so jurisdiction, right, back in the day, sort of fun functioned the same way. A judge would be like, mm, hey, affirmative. I don't think you're within my jurisdiction, so I can't vote for you. So if the affirmative stood up on this or stop, and would be like, hey, you should withdraw our troops from Afghanistan, a judge would be like, no, that's not within my jurisdiction. I only have the jurisdiction to evaluate affirmatives that economically engage Cuba, Mexico, and Venezuela. Right? Well, that's done. You don't do that anymore. Right? That's gone by the way so. Instead, we rely on competing interpretations to evaluate who wins topicality debates. Right? Who has the better view of what the topic should mean? Right? Competing interpretations simply argues that the interpretation of the resolution, in this case, what does economic engagement with the topic countries mean, creates the best of age, should be interpretation for both teams and the judge. Right? And that's what those actors should use when evaluating whether the affirmance are topical or not. Right? So potentially, right, there's a debate about what economic engagement means. Does it mean unconditional actions towards another country, i.e., I will give Deontay $10 regardless of what he does? Right? Or should it mean I will give Deontay ten dollars if he installs verbatim on his laptop in the next five minutes? Right? Those are two different things, right? One is just I give him money regardless, and the other is I give him money if he follows through a certain condition. Right? And as Michaela talked about yesterday, and as we're gonna talk about more today, that's a big debate about what economic engagement should mean. Right? And competing interpretation says we debate about what would be better for everybody involved in debate. Is it better to have a topic where the affirmative has to just give money to a country regardless of what they do? Or is it better for debate if we give money to a country, but they have to do something in exchange for that money? Okay? And that's what the debate would be about. What creates a better debate for everybody? Do we learn more from a topic that says, let's just be nice to them regardless? Or do we learn more from a topic by forcing affirmatives to be nice to countries only if those countries reciprocate or do something in exchange for that nice? Right? And in this case, a superior interpretation would be one that sets a better limit on the topic. Right? Remember, there are how many potential topics that we could research on the internet? Oh, Two gazillion. Okay? Right? Well, what do you think would be create a better topic for debaters? A topic that requires you to research 1.5 million topics? Or a topic that forces you to research one topic? One. Right? The smaller topic generally is considered a good thing, right? 
And one could argue that, hey, we allow for a smaller size of the topic, which is more manageable for everybody, ensures better debates, ensures a clash of ideas, et cetera. Right? Or, right, maybe your interpretation of the topic is better because it ensures better ground. Right? Remember when we talked about sort of the visual image of the circles? Right? When on the visual image, let's go back to that. Right? What about ground? Who has the most ground here? The negative, the negative right? But is it like overwhelmingly more than uh, affirmative? Yeah. Overwhelmingly so? No, overwhelmingly would be like this dot is the affirmative, and then every other part of the whiteboard is negative. That'd be crazy, right? In this case, there's at least, at least, yeah, okay, then it has more ground, right? But does the affirmative have a decent amount? No. Right? <laughs> According to Dante, no. But in my opinion, yeah. Right? You've got some choices. Both sides do. Right? But if, right, if the affirmative is only the red dot, and then everything outside of the red dot, then that might be too much ground for the negative, and that might be a reason why one interpretation of the topic is not fair. That ground isn't divided fairly between the two. Right? That it seems stacked in one side, and, uh, in favor of one side and not the other. Right? And so when we argue about our interpretations, right, our view of what the topic should mean, right, we always want to argue why it would be better for debate, right? It, set, it reduces the size of the topic so that everybody benefits. It creates a uh, division of ground that benefits both sides, et cetera. Right? The affirmative almost always says, nah, you know, well, we'll get to that. Reasonability, right? This is the sort of flip side. This is the, the, count, the counterpoint to competing interpretations, right? Competing interpretations is often used by the negative team in order to win top county debates. They're like, hey, our interpretation is better than yours. It creates a better learning of the topic. It ensures better ground for us. Therefore, we win. Reasonability is the oftentimes the affirmative reaction to that. Right? It's the counterpoint to the interpretations. Right? It involves around the notion of reasonability. Right? And reasonability means what? SAT 101. All right. So there's there's sort of like a logical component to it. Okay. There's also sort of just like a gut reaction. Right? You know it when you see it kind of thing. Okay? And reasonability sort of relies on those when evaluating top tally debates. Right? And as we mentioned up here, it involves the affirmative arguing that its interpretation of the topic, while maybe not as small as the one envisioned by the negative, and maybe while not as like friendly towards giving the negative the ground that they want, it still is good enough, right, to ensure that both sides can actually debate and have a good time. Right? And so a lot of you that have debate experience, you've heard the phrase good is good enough. Okay, it's sort of it, right? It's sort of like when you're in class. Like, let's say, like you know, you have to have an 85 on your final exam in order to make an A in a class. Okay. Presumably, you could study hard enough to get a what? Uh, 90 or an 85, since that's all you needed to do to get an A in a class, right? Or you could do what? Get a 90, 95, or 100, right? But is it really a comparative benefit to getting a 95 on that test if yeah. you only needed an 85 to get an A? Aside from pride, right, or maybe you're like going for valedictorian, not really, okay? Right, the goal is to get an A, and if you get an 85, that's sufficient. That's good enough to get that A. And likewise, reasonability says, look, our interpretation on the topic is good enough for both sides, right? It's good enough to give you ground, negative team, right? And it's good enough to set some limit on the topic, right? Our affirmative does not justify two billion topics that you have to research. Instead, it maybe right, justifies you having to research 50 affirmatives, right? And 50 affirmatives is a lot more manageable for you to research than 2 billion. And while you might be right that you maybe, like, maybe only make the negative team research 30 apps, and maybe you're right that the, your interpretation gives the negative team a couple more disadvantages, right? Is there really that big of a difference between the negative team having 10 disadvantages and 12 disadvantages? Not really, right? Is there really that big of a difference between the negative team having to research 30 affirmatives and 40 affirmatives? I mean, a little bit, but not like crazy, right? If, if the difference is like 30 versus a million and 30 versus 40, that difference is pretty small. And so when the affirmative appeals to reasonability, it makes those arguments. It's like, look, good is good enough, right? There's not that big of a difference between 30 apps and 40 apps. There's really not that big a difference between 10 disads and 12 disads. And what we've guaranteed you via our interpretation is good enough for you to compete. It's good enough for you to learn something about this topic. Therefore, you shouldn't vote against us because you think that we might not be top. Right? It appeals to judges' reasonability, i.e., their guts, their reluctance to vote against an affirmative team 
if they are related to the tau. Think about it this way, right? The death penalty exists in some states, right? And what is required for a state to use the death penalty to take someone's life? They have to do something very, very bad and have to get approval from Congress. Well, not Congress, no, because states have their own death penalty. Right, except for each state. But in general, right, you usually have to do what? Deontay's yeah, right. You have to murder. kill somebody, right? And, you know, presumably, right, it has to be demonstrated that you committed that crime in order for you to be put to death. Right? Well, think about topicality as the death penalty. Obviously not, like, analogous. Right? But the consequences are pretty big, right? If the negative team wins, the affirm is not topical. What happens to the affirm? It, it loses automatically, right? Because you fail to, you know, do one of your affirmative burdens and the affirmative bar still falls over, right? And likewise, well, right, if you fail to demonstrate that you're innocent when, when accused of murder, you might lose your life, right? The consequences are big, right? Now, I'm not saying that like losing our debate round is anyway analogous to losing one's life, but for a lot of people that are invested in debates, it's a big deal, right? You don't want to lose debates, especially in the topicality, right, okay? And because you will lose the debate if you're you know, deemed not topical, right? Oftentimes, teams appeal to a judge's reasonability. They're like, look, it's a, you don't know for sure we're not topical, right? They don't really have great evidence on this, right? They've only been able to point out just like little distinctions about like maybe the top is a little bit smaller under their interpretation, or maybe they get a little bit more ground, right? We shouldn't lose a debate because they get a little bit more ground under their review of the topic. We shouldn't lose the debate because they get fewer asks that they have to research, right? It's not worth the crime. The punishment isn't worth the crime, okay? And so reasonability appeals to that judge's sort of gut reaction. Like, I don't know. Like, Am I sure they're topical? I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure I don't want to vote against them if I'm uncertain. Reasonability sort of does that. Now, that's not to say like you should just be like, oh, there's a one percent chance we're T, therefore don't you know vote against this on nah, that's not good. Right? You still have to make some reasonable case that you're related to the topic, right? But at the same time, you don't want negative teams to just get away with, well, our interpretation is better for us than it is for them, therefore you get a vote negative on top count, right? Well, there are two impacts or overarching concerns that underline all theory debates, but especially top accounting, which is the preeminent theory debate in policy debate. Two impacts, two things that answer the so what question, right? So what if the affirmative is not top? Well, one of the impacts, one of the reasons, or one of the justifications or concerns related to that so what question is education, right? We engage in debate because of its educational benefits. Right? Your parents in your debate camp, they involve you in the debate activity because they think it will help you educationally. Right? You learn how to speak more confidently in public. You learn how to research topics in depth. You learn how to think critically and think on the fly. All of these are educational benefits that debate inculcates in you. Right? And topicality helps us ensure that those benefits are achieved. Right? Right? And it does that through a topic that's maybe smaller in nature. Right? Do you think you're going to be better at research if you research one topic rather than two billion? Yeah. I think so. Right? Because it's not the all exactly, and it's just hard to do. You'll get frustrated, and it's just not possible to research a billion things. Right? And so that's one thing. Right? Do you think that you're going to get better at speaking about a topic or thinking critically about an issue that you know in depth and that you've discussed in depth rather than maybe two billion things that you barely know anything about? Yeah, probably. Right? And right. It might just be educationally beneficial to learn how to, you know, learn a lot about one thing than a microscopic amount about a lot of things. Depth over breadth, so to speak. Right? And so one of the so what issues regarding topicality, why it matters, is this concern for education. Right? Topicality ensures, or at least attempts to ensure, that we learn as much as possible in the activity known as debate. And by creating a narrower topic, Right? It allows us to have in-depth right, discussions, which improves our research skills, improves our critical thinking, and allows us to be more confident in public. The second overarching concern, the second impact, so to speak, of topicality, right, is fairness, or what other people call competitive equity. Right? So in football, right, when you grab someone's face mask in order to make a tackle, what happens? You get on technical. Right? No, there's a flag, right? Tentacles in basketball. Okay. You throw a flag, right? But in general, right, a penalty is committed, correct? Yeah, right? And presumably, right, they throw flags and they penalize you because you've broken a rule. Okay? You can't tackle someone with their face mask. Okay, that's 15 yards, boom, tacked on the end of the play, whatever it might be. Right? Well, why do we care about rules? Why do they exist? 
because of that rules and the world is part of this territory. Right, it's kind of chaotic, right? It's kind of hard to manage the world without rules, right? They also ensure sort of predictability, right? We know what to expect, right? If you're a football player at Clark, you know, Central or at UGA or, you know, the Atlanta Falcons, right? You sort of know that, hey, if you're running with the football, someone can't punch you in the face, right? They can't bring you down with the face mask, and they can't trip you, believe it or not, tripping's a thing, right? And that's good to know, because it allows you some idea of kind of like how you can play football, right? If I were a running back, and I knew that I could get punched in the face or brought down with my face mask, I might not be that good at football, because I'd be afraid that someone would rip off my face or hit me in the head, okay? And the rules exist so that to create some notion of predictability, right, so that we can, I don't know, manage the world, in this case, manage the football field, right? In fairness, or competitive equity with regards to topicality, revolves around concerns over the size of the top, right? Bigger topics are unfair for the next. Remember, is it fair for me to ask you, a kid who's got a family, maybe a girlfriend or boyfriend, maybe a dog or Pokemon, right, or like some computer games or an avatar that you love more than anything else in the world, is it fair for me to ask you to sacrifice all of that stuff to research all the time two billion things? No, I can't do that. That's not fair to me, right? But when a topic is two billion potential things, Right? That's unfair for you the negative. It's unfair for us to expect that you can manage that effectively. Likewise, a smaller topic. Let's say that we, on the negative team, have defined topic value. We've defined the topic to say that economic engagement only means A, like money. It only means A. Like if we trade more with Venezuela, that's not economic engagement. Right? If we lift sanctions on Cuba, that's not economic engagement. Economic engagement only means giving money to a country, okay? Do you think that that's kind of terrible for the affirmative? Yeah. Yeah, right? Because some topics, or like some apps, like Venezuela, there isn't really anybody that advocates giving economic assistance to Venezuela, at least right now, right? At least not many people, right? That seems like it's too small, right? Like that dot that was like the size of the red thing, like this big, right? That dot becomes like this little mark right here. Right, and how bad would it be on the affirmative if this is what your ground looks like, this little black smudge, and the negative ground is all over the white on the board? That doesn't seem fun at all. That seems totally unfair, right? And so that's another reason why top county matters, right? Because fairness implicates how ground is divided, right? You want to appeal to that notion, appeal to the importance of rules, appeal to the notion of being able to compete on an equal basis, right? And you use top cut to do that, right? And oftentimes, top cut debates are evaluated on who wins that fairness impact the most, right? Is the affirmative better on arguing why the negative interpretation is unfair because it limits the affirmative too much, right? Or is the affirmative better arguing that the negative interpretation is bad, right? Or vice versa, right? Fairness is another impact or concern that people often use when debating. Education and fairness, those are the two so what questions regarding top cut. Why does it matter? Is this key to education? Why does it matter? Because it's key to fairness, right? And the best top quality debaters, the ones that had the most success, are the ones that appeal to those concerns most effectively. What does top quality look like? Okay. Negative teams simply top quality violations, right? In order to argue against a firm as they deem is not being related to the resolution, right? They sort of construct a, a formal sort of, you know, visual block or a visual sort of, you know, brief that says, Here's our definition of the topic. Here's why they aren't that. Here's why that's bad for the debate. Right? And these violations simply have four component parts. They have a definition or interpretation of the disputed resolutional term. Right? They have a description of how the affirmative isn't that. Right? They are not economic engagement, for example. They have reasons to prefer their definition, i.e., it's good to envision economic engagement as this. Right? And then they talk about the impacts of the affirmative failing to be topical. Right? This is bad for education because we possibly can't research all of the things that, they're, that they would justify. Or it's bad for ground, but just gives them way too much and doesn't give us enough. Right? And here's sort of an example of what that T violation would look like. Right? A, definition. Increase does not mean create. What? Yeah. Remember, these things are going to be put up, right, eventually. But there you go. I can post it right now if you want. Sure. Yeah. Do that. Maybe. We'll do that. You don't need yesterday's right now. You don't need mine. <laughs>
Okay, can I move on? Okay. Here's an example, right, of that. Right, now this is sort of simplified, it's missing some sort of things, but this is sort of what an example T violation would look like. When you're on the negative team, this is sort of what you would say in those debates. You'd say, so point A, definition, increase does not mean create. Webster's in 1993, or words and phrases in 1847, or Ricardo signs in 2013. Right. That'll actually be a possibility Quote, soon. Creswell dorm, eighth floor, whatever, right, it may be, however you want to say that. Right, increase does not mean create. B violation, the affirmative creates a new form of economic engagement in Venezuela rather than augmenting or increasing right, an existing form of economic engagement. Right? Let's just say the affirmative is like, hey, we're going to create this new economic policy that's like, we should like, play poker with Venezuela. Well, presumably we don't play poker with Venezuela now. The app creates a policy that creates poker with Venezuela, and that's not good for debate. Why? Well, how many things can be created from nothing? A lot. Right? Oh, okay. There's an infinite number of things that just can be magically created. Right? And it's hard to research infinity, to be honest. Right? But is it easier to research things that already exist? Yes. Yeah, because there are a non-infinite number of things that already exist, as opposed to the infinite number of things that can be created from scratch. Right? In, in a world of fairness and education, it's easier to research and learn about things that exist, and it's easier to right, deal with things that already exist now. Right? It's easier to research a topic that's like, hey, we're doing a little bit with Venezuela now, but we should do more of that. Right? It's not easy to research, but we aren't doing anything with Venezuela now, but we're just going to create something brand new. Right? So those are the reasons why it's maybe good for debate to make the affirmative not create new policies of economic engagement, rather to make them increase off of existing policies of economic engagement. Right? Indeed, we have our impacts. Right? It's an affirmative burden, we've got to do that, and topicality helps ensure fairness and education right? for both sides of the debate. Right? We have our definition of the topic, Right? We have a reason why they don't meet that definition. We have reasons why meeting that definition on the topic is good. Right? And then we answer the so what question. Why does it matter that the firm is topical? Right? Because not being topical implicates education and implicates fairness. And that's why we debate. Remember, it's up now. Yeah, now it's up. All right, so that's like the basics of topicality, right? Topicality 101, refresher for some of you, brand new stuff for some of you as well, right? This section on the topic is all about what the topic's gonna look like this year. Right? We're gonna talk about the specifics of USFG economic engagement towards Cuba, Mexico, or Venezuela, right? And remember, that's the resolution, right? You should know it by heart, like Rachel does, okay? USFG should substantially increase its economic engagement towards Cuba, Mexico, or Venezuela. Right? That's what you're debating this year. When someone stands up and is like, no, we're going to debate about shoes, you're like, uh-uh, not so much. Right? Remember, topicality revolves around what sh the resolution should mean for the purposes of debate. Right? Whose interpretation is correct? Whose interpretation is best for debate? Right? And remember, topicality ensures that the affirmative advocate that action. The affirmative has something to do with Increasing economic engagement with Cuba, Mexico, or Venezuela. Right? Topicality is your way on the negative to make sure the affirmative talks about what you're prepared to debate. Right? You're prepared to debate economic engagement with Cuba, Mexico, or Venezuela. You're not prepared to debate about space policy. You're not prepared to debate about whether athletes should be paid. Right? You're not prepared to debate whether pink is okay to wear when I lecture. Right? You're not prepared to debate that. Maybe you are, I don't know. Right? But you are prepared to debate economic engagement with the top of countries. And top county ensures that you force the, the other team to debate about those issues. Right? So that when they stand up and they're like, hey, we should withdraw troops from North Korea, or South Korea, I should say, right? you're like, mm, hey, that's not top. That's not what we're prepared to debate. And when you debate things that neither side is prepared to debate, that is bad for education and that's bad for parents. Key terms. Economic engagement. Right? Michaela talked a lot about, it, about this yesterday, right? In my opinion, this is the key phrase in this year's resolution, right? You gotta have an idea of what economic engagement means. And if you're gonna use topicality as an argument, especially on the negative, right? You need to have a very good idea of what you want it to mean, right? What, you know, and how that shapes, right, the size of the topic, right? It's the heart of this year's resolution, 
right? USFG is like the hand, substantially increased is like the arm, Cuba, Venezuela, Mexico are the legs, right? Economic engagement is the heart, right? It's the central part of the tap. You can't live without a heart. You can live with a fake lung, you can live with no kidneys, you can't live without a heart, right? You cannot live without knowing that you cannot engage. Okay? What does economic engagement mean is the central question about topicality arguments, right? The sheer. It's just the way it is. You've got to know what that is. Right? Affirmatives will likely define and interpret economic engagement in a broader sense, right? Because more options on the affirmative is usually a good thing. Right? If there's more affirmative ground, that means there's more things you can choose from. Right? And if there's more things that you can choose from, that means there's more that the negative team has to research, and that's good for the affirmative, and that's bad for the negative. Right? So the affirmatives will want to interpret economic engagement a little bit more broadly. Right? When you're on the affirmative, you want to be able to have economic engagement mean aid. You want it to mean trade. You want it to mean discussions. You want it to mean unilateral measures like lifting sanctions or cutting subsidies or you know, selling weapons. You want it to be sort of broader so that you have more choice. Right? Maybe you want to read Cuban Energy Cooperation. Or maybe you want to read Give technical assistance to Venezuela, or maybe you want to give, let's do more drug cooperation with Mexico, right? You want options, right? Sort of like when you're eating lunch today, right? You want options, right? How bad is it that you have to eat the same thing every day? Yeah. That's terrible, right? It gets, it gets stale, it gets lame. What happens if you only have one choice on the affirmative? It gets lame. Not fun, right? Not educational, not fun, not fair, right? And so the affirmative, it behooves you to define economic engagement in a broader sense that you give yourself more options. Negative teams, on the other hand, will try to define economic engagement in a more narrow sense. Remember, what's easier for you to deal with? Researching five things or two billion? Two billion. I'm back. Five things is easier than two billion things, right? It's easier. That's sort of easier for you to manage, right? It's more fair for you to be prepared for five things than it is two billion, right? It's more educational for you to learn a lot more about four topics than it is a million topics, right? And so in the negative, when you're arguing about topicality, you will want to interpret economic engagement to limit its scope, right? So that maybe only trade and aid become, right, actual things in economic engagement. But like unilateral measures like lifting sanctions is not top. Or like just talking to countries about economic issues, that's not top, right? You want it to be smaller because it makes your life easier and it ensures you learn more and have a better shot to win today. In my opinion, the best topicality argument involving economic engagement will revolve around whether economic engagement should be conditional or unconditional. Right? We used that example earlier. What would be unconditional engagement? Well, not sure. Without, without, conditions. without conditions, right? That I would give you 20 bucks, William, regardless of what happened. Right? That would be unconditional engagement. Right? And conditional engagement would be I will give you $20 only if you give me your pink food bill. Okay. Right? And that, in my opinion, is going to be what a lot of top county debates on this topic will be about. What does it mean? Right? Now, the Cuba app in our evidence packet is an example of what type of engagement? Unconditional. Why is that? Right, because it says we're going to get rid of, you know, we're going to get rid of restrictions on energy cooperation with Cuba, regardless, like, it doesn't matter what they do, we're just going to get rid of those restrictions. Right? But it would be conditional if it were to say what? Right, so maybe like, you know, we will lift restrictions on energy cooperation if you become a democracy. Right. Right, that would be conditional engagement. But that's not what it does. Right, so our affirmative as present says engagement must be unconditional. Which automatically means you on the negative can say what? No. Remember, the app is unconditional. So on the negative, you can say, you should be conditional, right? You shouldn't just give stuff to people for free, right? You should make them work for it, so to speak, right? That the term itself means conditional, and for the purposes of debate, it's better for both sides if the affirmative does something to a country and have to get them to do something in exchange rather than just doing something good for them, right? And in the evidence packet and the top quality file, and uh, there's some more cards in the pre-camp updates, right, in the evidence packet. And there's evidence, right, that's consistent with previous topic that deals with the issue of foreign engagement that sort of supports this 
whether engagement should be conditional or unconditional. Right? And this is the reason we all believe that this topic would be any different from that. There were big debates about what economic engagement or what engagement looks like there. And there's going to be a lot of debates on this year's topic about what engagement should be as well. In your evidence packet, it has both. Good evidence in support of it meaning unconditional, and good evidence in support of it meaning conditional. Right? You're going to have to debate that out. Right? Here are the evidence. Right? Let's talk about what each topic would look like under each interpretation, etc. Right? Another popular debate over economic engagement will circle around what types of stuff economic engagement includes. Right? So just gut check. Do we think that giving like financial assistance to a country is economic engagement? Yeah. Okay. What about trading with a country? Yeah. Right? Well, what else? Um, what else if I sent one dude over there? Let's say I sent the, the trade representative of the United States over to Colombia to just talk about stuff. Is that topical? Yeah. Some people say yes, some people are like, nah, maybe not. Yeah. Huh? All right, well, that's like a different question, right? We're just talking about whether that, that it's like economic engagement or not. Right. All right, so in Deontay's mind, right, as long as you're talking about something related to the economy, it's economic engagement. Right. And I want to do something that's going to help the So it's like, hey, I'm going to give, I'm going to give the Mexican president $2. That's economic engagement. No. Oh, okay. So it's not just talking about the economy stuff. It depends on what you're talking about. Okay. But as you can see, like there's some discrepancy about what sort of fits under the umbrella of economic engagement. There are certain things that we all kind of agree is probably economic engagement, but there may be some things on the margins that smell a little funny and might not rise to the level of economic engagement. Right now, as you can see, bilateral trade and direct investment aid are almost all considered economic engagement. But like negotiations over economic issues, it might or might not be, right? Selling military weapons, maybe just sending diplomats over, right? Doing unilateral things like cutting farm subbies, don't seem like they're examples of economic engagement. Now, this isn't cut and dry. These are just sort of like my assessment of the literature right now. But you're going to have debates about over all of these things. And as you'll be able to sort of deduce from reading the evidence packet, it's not super clear as to where the line is drawn for where economic engagement is and where it goes away. The only thing I can say is that most people think that like sanctioning a country or pressuring them or threatening them economically, but that's not really economic engagement, right? The vast majority of the literature and definitions seem to suggest that economic engagement means being nice to a country in some way, shape, or fashion, right? Um, but aside from that, there's a lot of gray area in terms of what economic engagement includes as an umbrella term. Trade and aid, obviously, right? Maybe economic discussions, maybe, maybe not, right? Military sales, eh, maybe not so much, right? But as you can see, right from yesterday in McKinley's lecture, there are lots of things that appear to be, or at least claim to be, examples of economic engagement, right? So for each country, right, how many possible affirmatives did McKinley outline? Like twenty or so, like for each country, and that's just like scratching the surface of potential affirmatives, right? And because economic engagement is the heart of the topic, and because it seems to have, right some breadth in terms of what it includes as an umbrella term, there might be a lot of potential affirmative that you need to keep in mind. Another key term in the resolution is increase, right? The example that we used a little bit ago is part of that, right? There are going to be lots of top county debates about the term increase, what it means, right? The most common example is increase means create, or increase means you got to increase off of something that exists now. That's like the old school most important. Right? But there might be other top county arguments like this. So is lifting sanctions on a country economic engagement? Yeah. Okay. There are some people that think maybe it's not, right? Because sanctions basically prohibit economic engagement. Right? They're just like you can't do it. Right? And if you get rid of something that says you can't do it, that automatically mean you do do it? It means you can, right? But it's is it guaranteed that you're going to economically engage Cuba if you get rid of the sanctions of the embargo? Not necessarily, right? And so is that guarantee the affirmative that increases economic engagement if it removes an obstacle to economic engagement? No, it's maybe sufficient. It's necessary for that economic engagement, but it's not sufficient to do so. And so there might be another argument, like a T increase argument that says, hey, just removing a barrier to economic engagement in and of itself is not economic engagement, right? It only facilitates or allows for future economic engagement. Therefore, the affirmative in and of itself is not an increase, right? 
sort of known as an effect T violation that you can talk more about later. But that argument would basically say that the affirmative itself is not directly increasing economic engagement, merely it's a step towards increasing economic engagement, right? But the F itself has to be that. It's, right? It's is in the resolution, right? It's not increase economic engagement, right? It's increase its economic engagement, right? Who, what does it refer to in the resolution? USFG, right? So one reading of the resolution is that USFG should increase USFG economic engagement with Cuba, Venezuela, or Mexico, right? Not business engagement, not like individual persons engagement, but rather USFG engagement. So Obama's got to increase Obama's engagement with Mexico, right? Well, what about the Cuba Act that's in the evidence packet, right? It, does it facilitate USFG engagement over energy with Cuba? No. no. Instead, it facilitates like oil company engagement with Cuba. And so there's a top cali argument that can be made that says, hey, it is possessive, right? Which means USFG has to increase USFG engagement. In the Cuba app and the evidence packet, it doesn't increase USFG engagement with Cuba over oil. Rather, it only increases business engagement, right, with Cuba over oil. And that is not top goal, and that's bad. Okay? You have to come up with reasons why. We'll talk a little bit about that later tonight. Right? But it's is going to be a really important part of the topic. Right? And as you can see, our app, right, there's a debate to be had about whether or not it needs to turn its in the resolution. Substantially, boom, right there. Another key part of the topic. Right? Substantially will be another source of top county arguments on this year's resolution. Right? Most substantially debates will involve whether or not increases in engagement should be quantitative, i.e., whether they like increase the engagement by a large percentage or by a like specific monetary amount, or whether it's qualitative, i.e., it's just better engagement. It's more engagement. We don't know like how much more, we just know it's more. Right? There was also, like you said, what's your name? Henry. Henry. It's also like what Henry said, right? There might be certain examples that like fail the smell test of substantially, right? That like maybe sending one person over isn't really substantial, right? Because does that seem meaningful as a form of economic engagement? Maybe not, right? If it's the undersecretary of right hemispheric affairs in cotton, I don't even know who that is, let alone whether that even exists, right? And would sending that dude or do that over to Venezuela be a substantial increase in economic engagement? I don't know, maybe not, right? Or to use the example I used with Deontay, right? Let's say we get $2 to Mexico. Is that a substantial increase in economic engagement? Maybe it kind of depends on what the peso is valued, right? $2 here might be like a gazillion in Mexico for all we know. But in general, no, it doesn't seem like a substantial increase, right? And so substantial, right, also serves as a check against these weird affirmatives that seem to be really tiny or maybe don't really do a whole lot with regard to economic um, engagement. And there are some other ways, another means by which people have defined substantially that we're going to talk about more um, in lab. But suffice it to say, you can define substantially in a way that supports an interpretation that says economic engagement should be unconditional. Right? And this sort of gets to using tactility to define multiple words in the resolution in support of a singular interpretation of what it can mean. Right, so not only defining economic engagement in a way that you think the affirmative doesn't meet, but defining economic engagement and defining substantially in ways that the affirmative doesn't meet. Right? Economic engagement means unconditional, and substantially means you can't put limitations on things. The affirmative puts limitations on its engagement because it says we will only do nice stuff to Cuba if they do something in exchange. It's not unconditional, so it's not economic engagement, and it's not substantial because it places a limitation on the nature of our engagement. Therefore, it's not top. Right? So in top reality, you can define multiple words in the resolution to prove the affirmative doesn't meet one interpretation of the topic. It's a little complex, we're going to talk more about that this afternoon, but keep that in mind. Substantially, in addition to being sort of an independent argument you can make as to why they're not substantial and thus not topical, you can also use substantially in support of other definitions of terms, right, to support an interpretation of what the topic should mean and why the affirmative doesn't meet. Other terms. Remember, the resolution is more than just increase substantially economic engagement in its, right? There are other terms in the resolution. And presumably, every term in the resolution can be defined in a way in support of a topicality argument. Now, do I think that like there are going to be very many topicality arguments regarding USFG? No. 
because most of arguments will deal with the USFG. Right? Do I think there's going to be a lot of topicality arguments related to the word should? No. Because most affirmance will be a normative statement or a suggestion as to what USFG should be doing. Right? But that doesn't mean that you won't hear them. So, for example, when I debated way back in the Stone Age, right, at the National Debate Tournament, which is like the national championship for college debaters, I wasn't involved in this round, but I heard about it. And a really good team from Emory lost the debate to a team from Oregon. And the team from Oregon read a topicality argument that said, the United States means the United States of Brazil. What? Yep. And Emory lost on that argument. They did not win that the United States does not mean the United States is of Brazil. How, how did they not? Because they took it for granted. They kind of blew it off. They're just like, oh, yeah, right, it does mean that. But they didn't need any evidence to challenge the claim the United States means the United States of Brazil. Right? And this Oregon team, just like was prepared to debate it, right? they had put in a lot of time on it, and Emory took it for granted, and what happened? They a lost on the argument that the United States means the United States of Brazil. Emory's never good at writing down text. Okay? It happens. Right? It happens. They're fine. Right? Somebody could stand up this year and be like, hey, toward means not toward. Right? You'd be like, oh, that's dumb. You gotta do more than that, right? Debate's more than just being like, uh uh, obviously it does. Or even there's more to that, right? Someone might stand up and be like, Mexico means Texas. Because at one time, it, was. it probably was. Okay? Like, someone's going to do that, right? And you can't just be like, oh my god, get out of here with that junk, right? <laughs> I mean, Deontay, that's like 2AC number one, right? <laughs> right? But 2AC number two, 2AC number three, 2AC number four, right, have to be arguments. They're like, actually, no. Mexico means the territory between X and Y, right? And it's, right, our interpretation is better for debate because one, it's grounded in reality, two, it's better for both sides, three, it's better for education, right? It's not 1842. Right? It's 2013, and believe it or not, Texas is different from Mexico. Okay? But all of these terms can be defined in weird ways, right? creatively so, right? to benefit the negative and to hurt you on the affirmative, or vice versa. Right? Maybe the affirmative defines them in creative ways to benefit them and to hurt the negative team. Yeah. I have a question. Yep. You just said that. Um, technically, can I just try to challenge you to like, but are we, are we really talking about 21st century context? You can, right? That's part of one process. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I want, I want but just like any argument your opponent makes, like you don't want to just answer with one argument, right? You you want to answer with a variety of arguments. So even if they're crazy enough to stand up and be like Mexico means Texas, right? You got to stand up and explain in a variety of ways why that's not only wrong but bad for debate. Okay, because it justifies after the like, but the Louisiana oh. Purchase is France or something. Like that. <laughs> Okay. Oh, no, that was... But as you can see, right, there are yes. other terms in the resolution. And even if you're like, there's no way someone's going to define towards as the opposite. Or or this one's my favorite. People will define or to mean and. What? Yep. Or yeah. does not mean or. Or means and. And so an affirmative has to increase economic engagement with Cuba, Mexico, and Venezuela. Like, does that make any sense? No. No. It does if you're like doing a Google search, right? Like it uses like Boolean search terms, right? But like how we normally talk, or it doesn't really make any sense. But someone's going to make that argument, and you got to be able to answer it. Yeah. So if you wanted to define or as and, you would just remember to say or. Before. No, you would, there would be like an old definition, maybe like in some old dictionary from like 1947, and like you know, like in like in Webster's, you look up the word like soup, like dance, and there's like 11 definitions, right? And one's like the old English version from like. 1217 BC. It's sort of like that, right? Some person is defined or to mean and in this like really specific instance. And it's like the 47th definition of or in Webster's, but you just sort of pick that because it's like, hey, the dictionary says or to mean and in some instances, and they use that as the definition as to why or means and. Now, being able to point out why that's like in a specific context, it assumes things like Boolean search terms, that isn't grounded in like normal grammatical ways we talk about things, that's how you answer it. But negative teams always want to creatively define the topic in ways that benefit them, right? And so you always need to be prepared of that reality and make sure that, like, you go into a tournament and you're like, there's no way anyone's going to find or to me in. Someone will. And so you at least have to have a sense of how you'd respond to that and answer that, just in case someone's crazy enough to do that. Like, do I think that, like, you're going to have a debate this year where someone stands up and says United States equals Brazil? No. But it could happen. 
right? And you need to at least envision the possibility of that happening so that you're not caught off guard. And so you, again, something kind of random, right? Well, Brazil is like the United States. It has like states, like we do. Oh. Okay. And so they probably found some <laughs> definition that's like, in Brazil, they call themselves the United States of Brazil. And so the United States obviously means Brazil. Oh. I mean, it really does. Right? Like the internet is huge. And there are some people that are very good at research. And they are very adept at finding some really weird stuff. Right? And whenever you get to a point, especially on topicality stuff, where you're just like, there's no way they're going to define toward to mean not toward. Someone will. Right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Well, that's the thing. I don't think there's a. I don't think it's called the United States federal government of Brazil. Yeah. There were some problems with this, right? The biggest argument, like they just lost because they didn't take it for granted. They didn't think about it at all. They made a team that had thought about it a lot, and that usually means that like sometimes truth loses out to better debate. Yeah. Ty. Uh, this is like off topic of uh, key terms and phrases. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to get to see if I asked you that oh, it's like a DA embedded in the E argument. Yep. I was wondering A, what that is, B, how to handle it. Well, one, like, not all T violations look like the one I have here. So, like, John Street, for example, is a team last year that, like, read, like, a, you have to be military, and then they read, like, a militarism critique in their T violation, right? That's not to say, like, it's sort of weird. It's, like, off the radar. But in general, is you got to pull up, right? And right. you got to make sure that, like, when you hear, like, oh, T economic engagement, that they actually, it's only economic engagement because they could hide something in it. You're not prepared to answer, you, and so you're prepared to respond. There's not, like, a rule against it. You right. can pretty much read, you can read counterplans on the case. You can read T violations on the case. Right? You can do all sorts of stuff if you want to. There's no rule against it, right? It just means you have to pay attention to so, not get caught off guard. When I well, let's say a military critique on the T. Yep. When I just respond to it, like, how would I respond to it? Would I just say the regular, how would I respond to a military critique outside of the T? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. You wouldn't, like, create a new page. It would just be like, top um, county, one, we need two counter definition, three, our standards are better, four, reasonability, five, militarism is stupid, six, no impact, and then move on. Okay. Just like if you had a counterplan with an embedded net benefit, right? Right. Okay. You mentioned okay. the counterplan part, and you mentioned oh, that benefit okay. on that same page. Oh, right. Here, let me finish up, and then mm -hmm. after that, uh, we'll answer any questions. Yeah. Right. So is that it? Have we covered T? Are we good to go? Well, we talked about it a lot, but there's some things that you need to know, right? This isn't the end-all, be-all about topicality, right? We're going to be discussing it a lot later today and throughout camp, right? And how to research it. Where this afternoon, in each of your labs, you're going to be constructing one NCT violation. Right, right now, your evidence packet just has cards. It doesn't actually have violations. And given that you're going to have practice debates in a couple of days, right, you need to be able to put together T violations. Right? And we're going to work on that today. And you also need to be able to put together answers to those T violations in the 2AC. And you're going to talk about that later today um, in this afternoon. You're also going to be having many debates over top quality arguments in lab, maybe later this afternoon. Have little debates about what the topic should mean. You get you know, up on that really important question of the, you know, what the topic means, right? And the last way, and the last thing I'll say is the best way to learn about topicality is to debate it. One thing that sort of happened in modern day debate is that topicality is not as big as it used to be. There just aren't that many people that want to debate topicality. It's like, oh, we want to debate whether or not economic class is good or bad, right, rather than debating what the topic should mean. Right? Or we want, to, we want to debate about, like, capitalism, rather than debating about what the topic should mean. Or we want to debate about Obama's political capital over what the topic should mean. My suggestion is to always have topicality available. Like, always be willing to debate it because it benefits you, right? On the negative, it allows you to find the topic in ways that help you strategically. On the affirmative, it helps you to defend your affirmative choices so that you have more flexibility to pick and choose what you want to defend on the topic. Don't forget about topicality. It's an affirmative burden. It's a negative weapon, right? It's super important, and you always got to think about it, and you should try to debate it as much as possible because that's the best way to learn more about it and to get better at it as well. Okay? That's all I got for you today. We'll answer a couple of questions and Austin will come in and uh, give his lesson. Okay? Questions? Yeah, RJ. Um, so, it was like, uh, you said earlier that like, topicality is a mess, an absolute mess. Yep. Um, so, is that, is that a judge thing? Is that, like, is that based on those judge practices? Or is that, like, I would like, say that mm, 95 out of 100 judges think that topicality is a voting issue and if the app is not to you, you lose. Like, 
better, but that's not where you're debating. Right? What? You're debating in high school. There aren't. Where are you like there's still like things like bump flaws in the draft. Mm -hmm. But so, uh, so like, is, is there like, I guess what I'm trying to ask is. What well, what I'll say is that you shouldn't take it for granted that T is always a voting issue. You have to explain why, right? And I think the, those teams do well because teams have forgotten the sort of justifications for why top tally should exist, right? Why there should be a requirement to be a person to come into a debate, right? Debating a common topic that everybody is prepared for. Um, people just sort of, I think, for years took it for granted because 95 out of 100 judges were just like, yeah, it's obviously a voting issue. And we haven't really thought about why a firm has to be tackled. Um, and the other team has thought about why they don't have to be. Right? They're going to debate it better than you do. And so judges are going to be inclined to vote for them because they did the better debating. Right? And they'll vote for them even if they're not toppled because they were able to explain why it's OK or not. But in high school, it's not like Bronx is like, you know, obviously a team that does that. But there aren't as many Bronx laws, right? There aren't as many beacons, right? They're usually just sort of a handful of teams. In college, there's a little bit more. And we'll see if there are going to be more of those teams in high school, not, maybe, maybe not. But for most teams, like when you're debating, like, you know, Bronx Science, or if you're debating, you know, Chattahoochee or, you know, Pace, right? If you win T, you're going to win the um, But like you said, there are some exceptions. But that just, you know, puts the onus on you to learn really why. Top tally is important. Why it is important. Cool. All right, so uh, you should grab some water. Be back here in like five minutes. Okay. See you just not. Okay. Sorry, what? See you just not gonna have me in solve I'm Sorry, what?